Well, we've looked at missions from a couple of different angles. Uh, we started with looking at the kind of um, biblical theological perspective, uh, missions through the Bible, looking at what the Old Testament had to say about this concept of mission and our God who is on mission and all about mission. We saw that it wasn't just a New Testament concept. It's not something that just came about. Um, and then on last week, we looked at that sort of quintessential text of Scripture. Uh, we looked at the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28 and looked at, sort of unfolded all the things that that said to us about missions. And on this week, what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, the message of Second Timothy, which gives us um, kind of a, a very particular and very specific application to this idea of mission. Um, so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open to the book of Second Timothy. The message of the book of Second Timothy uh, really sort of summed up in these three words, preserve, proclaim, endure. And we'll see that as we go through and look at this pattern. In this pattern, you see these two main ideas that Paul communicates to Timothy. One, to preserve and proclaim the gospel that is given by the apostles. That, that's, that's the first prong. Preserve and proclaim the gospel that is given by the apostles. And the second prong is to endure the hardship that inevitably will follow. And you see these two things in every chapter of 2 Timothy. These two things are repeated again and again and again throughout 2 Timothy. The idea of preserve and proclaim. First, uh, in chapter 1, verse 8, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. Chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. Follow the pattern of sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Again, this is the idea of preserving and proclaiming the gospel. You have to remember the context. You have to remember that this is, this is burgeoning Christianity. You have to remember that there is persecution. Not only is there persecution, but there is also apostasy. And so it's very important that the gospel is preserved, that the nature of the gospel is preserved so that it, it doesn't become heretical. And it's also important that it's proclaimed so that it spreads abroad. Chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Preserve, proclaim. Okay? Chapter 3, verses 13 to 16. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed. There is the preservation, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and by his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Uh, reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. This is incredibly important on a number of levels. Um, note here that there is this call for young Timothy to preach the word and to do it in this word in season, out of season, eukairos, akairos. Um, there's two types of time in, in the rendering in the Greek language. There's, there's chronos, that's, we get our word chronological, right? Chronos, what time is it? And then there's kairos, which is seasons or opportunities. And so when he says here, you kairos, a kairos, whether it's a, a good season for it or a bad season for it, um, what's meant here is that 
regardless of what it seems to be doing, preaching is always what we do. Regardless of whether people like preaching or not, preaching is what we do. And so, for example, when we're in the midst of, you know, the Great Awakening and people like um, Whitfield are preaching and tens of thousands of people would come and gather in a field to hear him preach um, just because that's what people did. Uh, that was a great time for preaching, right? That was a great time for preaching. Um, now, not so much. Now we use phrases like, don't preach to me, or that sounds preachy. In many uh, seminaries, for example, over the last generation, uh, preachers have been taught to shorten their sermons. Um, the idea is that, you know, the, the attention span is shortened today. Uh, television understands this because for the most part, television gives you short bursts and then they give you commercials, right? Because we don't have much of an attention span. Um, there's a, a show on yesterday. I don't remember even what it was or where it was or wherever. We don't watch, you know, a whole lot of television. But during this season, especially, you know, you got like the Thanksgiving Day Parade and all these things that we just like to watch, you know. And I noticed the new thing that they're doing. First of all, they have the symbol of the station down at the bottom. I get that, you know. People are changing through and they got a hundred and something channels. You want them to know what your channel is. When they flip through, you see the little thing down at the bottom. That's, that's, I, I get that. And they had this deal up at the top that said, you know, the next show is the premiere of so-and-so and it was a countdown. I'm like, that's bothering me. Get that off. Can I get, can I, can I get that off? There's nothing you can do to get that off. That, that, all that is about people's attention spans, you know? And so the idea in the last generation was that preachers need to acknowledge this shortened attention span and several things need to happen. Number one, you need to not preach as long. So the idea is that you would preach for 20 minutes, okay? 20 minutes. Um, that, that's, some of my training was in that regard. Um, so I've, I've kind of ignored that, as you, as you know. Um, the other thing was that, you know, now preaching is, you know, you got to have all of these other things with your preaching. Um, and so there, now there's preaching and there's the video clips that are added to sermons and all this sort of stuff because it has to be multi-sensory in nature. Um, ironically, God has given us a multi-sensory experience through the Lord's Supper. We won't do that, but we'll do movie clips during our sermon to get multi-sensory. Um, anyway, don't get me started on that. Um, four, why? why? Why is he telling Timothy that he has to commit to this? You've got to commit to this because the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. They won't endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and will wander off into myths. Interestingly enough, there are a lot of people who look at false teachers today uh, or who look at people, you know, who, who, who preach something other than the gospel today and they say, why is it that these people are the ones who are growing churches so large and so fast? Why is it that this is happening? As though we're doing something wrong, you know? But listen, this is what Paul said was going to happen. People are not going to endure sound doctrine. So the tendency is going to be to back off of sound doctrine so that people can be appeased. And then the next thing you know, you're preaching anything but sound doctrine. And it becomes pop psychology from the pulpit, self-help, so on and so forth. Anything but sound doctrine because people will not endure sound doctrine. The second half of this is endure hardship. So, have to, so first, the idea of preserve and proclaim. And we see that that's in every chapter. The second half of this is endure hardship. Chapter 1, verse 8. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about the Lord, nor me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Isn't that interesting? There are those who would argue that if you're suffering, you need the power of God in your life so that you don't suffer anymore. Paul says you're suffering by the power of God. You're not suffering because God's not present. You're not suffering because God's not powerful. You're suffering and enduring the suffering because God is present and powerful. 
So those who are arguing that, you know, people who are having suffering, you, you got suffering in your life, you just don't have enough faith. You have suffering in your life, you're, not, you're just not believing enough. If you just believed enough and you held on it, no. That's the opposite of what Paul teaches is true. Chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. For which I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. Paul doesn't say he suffers because of a lack of faith. He says he suffers because of his appointment by God. This is why I suffer as I do. Again, this just completely explodes the prosperity gospel. Chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. So he said, share in suffering. This is what he's calling young Timothy to do. Verses 8 and 9 of chapter 2, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. He's suffering because he preaches the gospel. Chapter 3, verses 10 to 13. This is, the, to me, this is the pinnacle of his explanation and it's also the pinnacle of the refutation of the prosperity gospel. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my practice, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra. You know what's interesting? People say we suffer, why? We, we suffer because we don't have enough faith. We suffer because we don't, whatever. Notice he says his conduct, his aim, his faith, his patience, his love, his steadfastness. He has all of these things. The apostle has all of these things that characterize his life. And he has suffering that characterizes his life. Which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. When people are naming and claiming things from the Bible, half the stuff they're naming and claiming actually belongs to Israel as a nation, right? We love, for example, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, turn from their wicked ways, and so on, you know, we, we love that, right? National Day of Prayer, we're all over that. We don't even acknowledge the fact that God says he will hear the prayers offered in this place. What's this place? The temple in Jerusalem. Second Chronicles 7.14 is about prayers offered in the temple in Jerusalem by the Jews. And so we rip that kicking and screaming out of context, apply it to America as though America is the new Israel of God. That's horrible. It's horrible. When we got promises like this that are just ours, we can go grab them. You can claim your persecution anytime you want to, in Jesus' name. But we don't want to do that, right? We want to find other things. But he says, all those who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus shall be persecuted. While evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Why is the prosperity gospel prospering? Why are these false teachers getting, you know, such, it's right here. It's right here. This is why. Paul also says there must be divisions among you. Why? So that you can know who's genuine. Chapter 4. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. So you see, in every chapter, there is preserve and proclaim. And in every chapter, there is endure hardship. This is the central message of this letter. And it's very important, especially when you understand from the beginning that Timothy is a young man who suffers with weakness and fear. And Paul is essentially about to be put to death for preaching the gospel. And he writes a letter to young Timothy who struggles with 
timidity and weakness and fear. And he says, essentially, they're about to kill me for preaching the gospel. And when they do, I want you to take my place and do the very thing for which they're putting me to death. I want you to suffer with me. That's what he's saying. That's why he says to him, God has not given us a spirit of fear. That doesn't come from God. Reject that. It doesn't come from God. Well, what about the content to be preserved and proclaimed? This is important. And again, understand how this fits into our concept of missions. Because what are we doing in missions? What we're doing is we're preserving and proclaiming and enduring the suffering that inevitably will follow. This is what, this is the mission. Paul is giving Timothy the mission. The mission is that we preserve the gospel. We preserve its essence. We preserve what the apostles have taught. The mission is that we proclaim it, that we spread it abroad, okay? Whatever you have heard from me in the presence of faithful men, entrust this, entrust this to others who will be able to teach it also. I just butchered that completely. I don't know why. All right. What's the content? Being committed to apostolic teaching. It's a common Pauline theme. It's a common New Testament theme. And confessionalism is a guard and a guide for this. Committed to apostolic teaching. Look, verses, verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus. To whom is he writing this? Second. Timothy, verse, chapter 1, verse 1, he's writing it to Timothy, thank you. All right, Timothy, right? He's writing it to everybody sitting there like, this is a trick. I know it's a trick. <laughs> no, it's not a trick. It's not a trick. He's writing this to Timothy. Does he know Timothy or does he not know Timothy? He knows him well. He knows him well. They've endured much together. He, you know, he, you, you, knew, you know all my persecutions. You know my sufferings. He says, you know, they, they've shared tears together. He knows him very well. So does Timothy know or not know that Paul is an apostle? And yet, he introduces this letter. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Not Paul, your father in the faith but Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Why? Because he is, what he is writing is based on his apostolic authority. It's not based on his relationship with Timothy. It's based on his apostolic authority, okay? He's not calling Timothy to do this because they have love for one another. He's calling Timothy to do this because it's his job as an apostle. And he's calling Timothy to obey, not because of his respect for Paul as a person, because of his, but because of his respect for Paul's office as an apostle. This is important. Chapter 1, verse 11. For which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and teacher. He reminds him again, right there in the first chapter. I'm an apostle. I'm an apostle. This is a common Pauline theme. Second Thessalonians, chapter 2, verse 15. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the tradition that you the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. You know, it's interesting. The word preaching is a negative word in our culture and among Christians, especially younger Christians. The word preaching is a negative word, okay? You don't do a sermon, you do a talk or a message, right? We don't, we just, it just, it's a negative idea. The word religion is a negative idea, you know? Well, you know, Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship. Really? Tell that to James, okay? Tell that to James, who talks about true religion. And another idea that we hate is the idea of tradition. Tradition and traditionalism. 
right? Again, there are empty, dead traditions. But here's, here's what we've come to. We, we've come to, there, there's a word, you know, we've come to applaud contemporaneity. In other words, the idea that something is better if it's newer. It's better if it's newer. It's gotta be the best, newest, shiniest thing because newer is always better. And so what we value is whatever is new, whatever is contemporary. So it's one thing where Jesus talks about dead tradition, right? And, and he, he lambastes the, 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 uh, the Pharisees because of their dead and empty traditions, right? And rightfully so, because dead, empty tradition um, is just that. It's dead, it's empty, it's not profitable. However, Jesus kept all of the traditions of the Jews. We're going through right now, you know, Exodus chapters 11 through 13 and looking at the Passover. And on last week, I made the point that if the Jews had not kept that tradition, we would not have been able to understand the gospel. Christ's death, burial, and resurrection would make no sense without these traditions being upheld. And so what we've done is, you know, in the spirit of contemporaneity, everything that's new and contemporary is automatically better. Everything that is traditional is automatically worse and it's automatically empty. So we're always trying to innovate. We're always trying to have a newer, fresher experience because newer and fresher is better. But the apostle says, hold on to the traditions that I taught you. Why? because he's an apostle. And these traditions are just as important as the traditions that were given to the Jews. Without those traditions that were given to the Jews, we would not understand redemption. Without the traditions that were given by the apostles, we would not maintain the faith, okay? Chapter one, verse nine. Uh, Titus one nine, I'm sorry. The elder must hold firm the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also rebuke those who contradict it. Again, what is he holding on to? He's holding on to apostolic teaching. He's holding firmly to apostolic teaching, not the spirit of the age. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 43. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and the prayers and awe came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. They held on to the apostles' teaching. We hold on to the apostles' teaching, we have to. Confessionalism is a guide and a guard for this. Second Timothy 1, 9 and 10, listen to this. Who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Chapter 2, verses 8 through 13. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel for which I am suffering bound with chains as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is trustworthy, for if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. That last phrase is in poetic form. When Paul talks about according to my gospel, according to my teaching, when he talks about the pattern of sound words, what he's talking about is the idea of confessionalism. The idea that there are things that the apostles repeated over and over and over again. There are things in the form of early hymns. And we know that they're early hymns because we know what early songs were like and how they were written. And in our uh, Bibles, they're often, you know, put off um, in, a, in a poetic form so that you can see. 
that they are hymns, that they are New Testament, New Testament canonical hymns. These, these are the ways that these things were passed on, okay? And so confessions are not something foreign to the teaching of the New Testament. Confessions are something that are very much in keeping with the New Testament. The, the idea that we codify these words, these, this pattern of sound words to which we hold. So we have hymnody, which is important in this regard. We have creeds, confessions, and cate catechisms. Why are creeds, confessions, and catechisms important? Uh, they connect us with the historical church. They connect us with the historical church. We don't have to figure out everything on our own all over again, every generation. Amen. Amen. And we don't do this anywhere else, right? We don't do this anywhere else. This is why we pre preserve knowledge in academies and things of this nature. Um, it clarifies our doctrine. It clarifies our doctrine. What is that pattern of sound words to which we hold? Um, it's a guide for discipling children and new converts. Catechisms and confessions are guides for discipling children and new converts. If you don't use catechisms and confessions for discipling children, for discipling new converts, we're just sort of stuck out there. And everybody's trying to figure out, you know, how do we disciple people? You know, what does your church use for discipleship? You know, what are you doing for discipleship of men? What are you doing for discipleship of ladies? What are you doing for discipleship of teenagers? What are you doing? For? Well, I found this great stuff. In the, and generally, those discipleship materials go a little bit like this, okay? They go, you know, phase one is kind of, all right, here's, here's what it means, you know, to be a Christian. These are kind of the, the points of the gospel. Phase two, uh, here's how you have a, a quiet time. Um, phase three, here's how you find your spiritual gift. Um, you know, phase four, um, you know, here's how you go do something. Is that, is that it? Is that all? And most of the time when we talk about discipleship, it's, a, it's just a few weeks, right? Just a few weeks of discipleship. But if you look at historic creeds, confessions, and catechisms, what you see is that people were being discipled into apostolic teaching. You don't have to sit around going, yeah, what do we use for discipleship? And get, grab you a catechism. You'll have more than you can say grace over. You'll have years worth of material to take someone through. Years worth of material. And whether it's a new believer who's an adult or a child who's being raised in our home, Taking them through the catechisms and taking them through our confessions is rooting and grounding them in apostolic teaching. And it blows the doors off of anything else that we're calling discipleship today. Finally, it exposes and guards against cults. You know, I'm, again, I'm always amazed, especially among our, our, our brethren. I could talk about Southern Baptists because I are one, you know. And there are always those people who are like, you know, we're, we're, we're not a creedal people. We have no creed but Christ. The Bible is my confession. That sounds great, doesn't it? It sounds pious. But someone who says no creed but Christ, guess what? That's not in the Bible, which means it's a creed. Do you follow me? No creed but Christ. That's your creed. So you do believe in creeds. And the person who says, well, the Bible, the Bible is my confession. Oh, really? So you're going to let Mormons in? You're going to let Jehovah's Witnesses in? You're going to let, whoa, 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 now, wait a minute now. You're going to let Roman Catholics in? Whoa, 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 uh -uh. Well, why not? Because they could make that same, they could, they could hold up the same Bible you hold up and say, my confession is what's right in here. Yeah, but they don't believe the same thing. They are wrong about Jesus. They're wrong about this. They're wrong. Oh, wait a minute. You just got confessional. The moment you start explaining the difference between you and the cults, you became confessional. Okay? So it's nonsense when people say that they're not creedal or they're not confessional. We absolutely are. If we're not, we open the door to anything and everything. And we destroy our unity. Okay? The, bring it to the concept of missions. 
So now we're going and we're doing missions, right? You go somewhere and you're going to establish a church in a place and a culture that doesn't have the church. They don't know anything. They don't know come here from Sikkim, right? What do you do? Where do you start? Creeds, confessions, catechisms. That's what you do. That's where you start. In cultures that don't know anything about anything, you start with creeds, confessions, and catechisms. That's where you begin. It's corporate proclamation. You've heard this in the presence of many, right? That which you've heard from me in the presence of others. Our preaching should be doctrinal. Our preaching should be doctrinal. We don't just preach self-help, okay? We don't just preach spirit of the age. We don't just preach for entertainment. We don't just preach for inspiration. Our preaching should be doctrinal. It should be fortified by our creeds, confessions, and catechisms. Secondly, our preaching should be expository. This is why we do expository preaching. What parts of the Bible do people need? All of it. All of it. So what parts of the Bible should we preach? All of it. All of it. This is why we go back and forth between Old Testament and New Testament, and this is why even when we go back and forth, we go to different types and genres of literature, okay? So now we're in Old Testament, you know, Pentateuch, law. Next time we'll go back to the New Testament, and then we come back to the Old Testament, and we've just done Pentateuch, law. Before that, we did prophets, so we'll probably go back to wisdom or the writings again so that we can have a variety and preach the whole counsel of God, okay? That's why our preaching should be exhaustive. Why? Because we are trying to develop, we're trying to build a body of discipled believers. And so we need creeds, catechisms, confessions. We, we encourage these things to be happening in homes so that people are being built up, right? And then we preach sermons that are doctrinal in nature. They're expository and exhaustive in that we're handling the whole counsel of God. You sit under this over a period of years, and it changes the very way you read the Bible. You're not just lost when you open the Bible. But you sit under spirit of the age preaching. You know, you, you, you sit under pop psychology preaching. Five ways to have a happy life, ten ways to reduce stress, four ways to grow healthy, happy kids, yada, 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 that doesn't give you anything. Because when the sermon is over, it hasn't expounded on the text, so you can't figure out how it came out of there, right? But you sit under exposition for a while, and eventually you see how it is that we're interpreting Scripture. And you become better at interpreting and handling the Scriptures. And you hear preaching from variety of texts from different parts of the Bible, you begin to get a more full-orbed understanding of the Bible as a whole. It's personal instruction. Folks, personal instruction is time-consuming and it's risky. And this is why in most places it's not done. This is why in most places people would just as soon trust the academy. Right? Somebody feels a sense of calling from God, send them to seminary. Send them away. We don't have time for that. And it's risky. 2 Timothy 1, 2 through 7. To Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Christ Jesus our Lord, I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day, as I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control. Folks, Paul knew Timothy. He knew his strengths and he knew his weaknesses. He was Timothy's pastor. He wasn't just Timothy's professor. He was Timothy's pastor. He prayed for Timothy. 
because they had a personal relationship. Paul knew Timothy's family. He knew his family background. He knew where this guy came from. Paul and Timothy served together. This wasn't theoretical in nature. They served together. This young man served alongside the apostle and Paul and Timothy cried together. This is a real relationship. This is what that personal instruction looks like. When pastors and elders take young men under their wing and teach them. And it is risky because you're making an investment and you don't know that that investment's going to pay off. You don't know that that investment's going to pan out. And, and in many instances, it doesn't. Many instances, you pour your life into young men and they end up going and doing something else and they don't serve in the ministry or they end up going in another direction or they end up whatever. But you can't not do this. We can't not do this. We have to do this. We're called to do this. This is the pattern. This is how the mission advances. What is the commission? To entrust a faithful man. It must be intentional and purposeful, and it must be selective. This is not just everyone. This is not just everyone. Pastors and elders don't give equal time to all men. You don't. There are some to whom you give more time. Why? Because they're faithful men to whom we need to entrust these truths because God is calling them to entrust these truths to others. Selective, called men, called men. There are a lot of men who say, you know, hey, I'd love to go through the leadership training because I'd love to have more knowledge. Wrong answer, wrong answer. This is not just because you want to know more stuff. Has God called you? Is there a burning in your bosom? Can, can you say like Paul, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. I will die if I don't preach the gospel. Is there a calling? Is there a passion? Is there a yearning? Is there fire in your belly? That's the question. Not, I'd really like to have more information. Well, so would I, right? Is there a calling? Gifted men, gifted men. Anybody can say, you know, I believe I'm called to do this. But gifted men. You can say, I believe God's called me to play in the NBA. But if you're under six feet tall and can't dribble with your left, you're probably wrong, okay? Just going to go out on a limb here and say, you're not going to make it, all right? Are, do, are you gifted? Do you have these gifts? Do you have these gifts? Because again, the ministry, the mission is not just about men, you know, who, who like information and who can acquire information. This is about men who are gifted. Are you gifted? Do you have those gifts? Qualified men. Do you meet the biblical qualifications? Okay. Tested and proven men. Have you been tested and proven? So, you're, you have gifts, talents, abilities, and desires in the life of a qualified man whose life is scrutinized by the leadership of the church and its members, who's tested and tried and trained, who's then unleashed to do his thing. This is how the mission is perpetuated, okay? And this is not every man. This has to be selective, okay? And this is hard. It's really hard. It's really hard. It's hard for us as elders especially, you know? Because sometimes you have guys who've got all the passion in the world. They're not called or gifted. But they got all the passion in the world. They love the Lord, they love the church, and they're like, here, here man, I'm here. Come on, let's do this thing. You know, it's great, but no, no, it's all of these things. It's all of these things. 
Does that mean there's no place for you to serve? Nope, doesn't mean that at all. It's intentional. We must seek to provoke called men. We must seek to provoke called men. There is a sense in which there are some men who are called and gifted, but they'll just sit there unless they're provoked. Different men have to be provoked in different ways. Some men just have to be asked. And they go, wow, really? I never thought about that. But now that you say it, you know, sometimes it happens like that. Some men have to be challenged. Some men have to be challenged. Sometimes you have to come to men and say, here you are, a called and gifted man. You have elders and deacons who are carrying weight on their backs that is about to break them like twigs. And you sit there and suck up and give nothing. How dare you? With all the gifts that you have, how dare you? Sometimes that's what it takes. And as elders, you can understand the difference between the guy who needs the carrot and the guy who needs the stick, right? <laughs> and it becomes even more frustrating for the guy who needs the stick because you got the guy over here who doesn't have the calling and the gifting and he's going, oh, 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 oh. And you got the guy over here who's a first round draft choice and he's going, We must seek to equip called men. We gotta equip called men. We gotta give our lives to them. We must seek to evaluate called men. All these things have to happen. And I'm grateful, I am grateful for the way that this happens here and has happened here at GFBC. And the way that you guys have allowed us to do this. We're gonna have another group starting in January. God has sent us, what, four, five young gifted men um, who are ready to start the leadership program. We haven't done it for a couple of years because we just haven't had a pool, you know? Now we've got a pool. God has sent us, you know, five or six young, energetic, intelligent, articulate, gifted, passionate, ministry-minded men. Um, and so in January, we're going to start again. And we'll see what we get. We'll see what we get. Continuity, who will be able to teach others also. That's the goal, because this is the mission, right? It has to continue on. So we have to get into individuals who are able to teach others also. Listen to this from John Calvin. He again shows how earnestly desirous he is to transmit sound doctrine to posterity. And he exhorts Timothy not only to preserve its shape and features, as he formerly did, but likewise to hand it down to godly teachers that, being widely spread, it may take root in the hearts of many. For he saw that it would quickly perish if it were not soon scattered by the ministry of many persons. And indeed, we see that Satan did not long after the death of the apostles, for just as if preaching had been buried for some centuries. He brought in innumerable reveries, which by their monstrous absurdity surpassed the superstitions of all the heathens. We need not wonder, therefore, if Paul, in order to guard against an evil of such a nature and of such magnitude, earnestly desires that his doctrines shall be committed to all godly ministers who shall be qualified to teach it. In a very short time, in a very short time, heresy and apostasy abounded. In fact, you, you look at the cults today and you can trace them back to first century heresies um, in almost every case. These are not things that are new. These are things that happened almost immediately. And this is where this, this almost desperation came from. This is, this is why missions are important. And this is why we do it in this fashion. And this is why every local church ought to see itself as a sending entity. This is why church planting is not something, you know, that's for certain churches who are out there, you know, on the elite Green Beret side of things. 
but it's just who we are and what we do. Again, in our culture, we have a mentality that says we need to grow and expand right here. You know, we need to do everything that we can to grow and expand right here. We need to build bigger barns so that we can meet, you know, more people in bigger barns. And, you know, that's, that's just what we need to do. And, you know, we have churches here. I, would, <laughs> I told you I served on a church staff that had uh, dozens, dozens of, of ministers, dozens of preachers in one church, on, on one church staff. Um, mind-boggling, absolutely mind-boggling. Um, but that's the mentality here, as opposed to the mentality being, we need to raise people up, we need to send people out, we need to plant. Um, and again, I'm not against uh, the idea of churches growing. I don't think there's a certain size beyond which a church becomes sinful in its growth, necessarily. Um, if that was the case, the first, the, the first you know, several gatherings and meetings were sinful, um, uh, they're in Acts. Um, so I'm not arguing that that's the case at all. Um, but we have to have this idea and this mentality that says, we are going to raise up, we are going to train, um, we are going to evaluate, and then we are going to send out these gifted men. That's not easy to do, folks. I promise you it's not easy to do. It, it hurts, it really does. It, 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 an interesting thing happens when you, when you plant churches, when you send people out. It's sort of like, I have heard this and now I can say yes and amen. Sort of like when you have a child who grew up and get married. You know, the child grows up and gets married and you're like, yes, this is what we raised them for. This is what's supposed to happen. This is good. This is healthy. This is God honoring. Amen. And then you walk up to their room and it's empty and you just want to cry. You know, and you've got to remind yourself, no, this is a good thing. This is a right thing. There's more that's going to come from this that's good, that would not have come from this had it not happened. And the same thing happens when you plant churches. You know, we have gifted men, and there have been gifted men who've come and who've trained and everything else and other people who we love and who are our friends. And then you go and you plant a church and you walk into church and there's not as many people here as there were before. And psychologically, there's something that happens to you. It doesn't matter that it was a good thing. It doesn't matter that it was for a good reason. If you walk in here one day and there's 300 people, and then a week later there's 200 people, something on the inside of you goes, something's wrong. This is not good. When you walk in and there's people that you know and love who are not here anymore, and they're meeting somewhere else, something on the inside of you goes, something's wrong, this is not good. I so appreciate those of you who out of your love and care for me and Stephen, you know, have been over the last several months just kind of shaking your head going, what are you guys going to do? We appreciate that. We appreciate that you recognize that it's hard, you know, for, for, for two guys to do uh, the things that, that we're called to do. And it's just a lot of stuff that we can't get to. Um, we, we, we appreciate that you recognize that. But at the same time, we have to recognize that we don't have the right to hold on to gifted men for the sake of our convenience. We, we don't have the right to do that. And so we pray that God will continue to reinvigorate and to send gifted men. We pray that his church will continue to grow, not only in the number of the people that are reached through the ministry of this church, but also in the number of people who step up and become engaged in the ministry of this church and who expand the ministry of this church through launching out in ministry from this church, okay? So this is that process. This is what it looks like. And it's the normal, natural process of being the church, okay? All right, questions? Yes. Yeah, good question. Question is, am I saying that it's not the seminary's role to train pastors and equip elders, but it's the church's role? Um, yes and no. Um, yes, I'm saying that that's the role of the church. I'm not saying that seminaries can't be helpful in that regard. But Christ didn't establish seminaries. He established churches. 
Churches are responsible for raising, training, evaluating um, ministers. And I think there's something very unhealthy that has happened to the church, especially in this culture, uh, because of the nature of seminary training. And so now we look at, instead of looking at um, ministry as a vocation, as a vocation um, and a calling, we now look at it as a profession. And so guys, you know, grow up and are raised up in their churches, oftentimes not even having served or done anything to be evaluated by their church. They go off to seminary and get a degree. The seminary doesn't know them, really. Um, the seminary is not really evaluating them as ministers. They now have a degree. They have credentials. They pass a test. Um, and they go start pastoring the church. Well, there's several steps missing there that are of vital importance from a New Testament perspective. And that is having this individual be mentored and discipled and evaluated by people who know him and people with whom he's serving side by side. Um, so can a seminary be a useful and helpful partner in that process? Yes. Is this a process given to the seminary? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And good seminaries will tell you that. Yes? Difference between an apostle and a preacher? Um, uh, the apostles are people who are sent particularly and specifically by Christ. Um, the, the best way to understand that is there in Acts chapter 1 when there was... Uh, the decision to replace Judas and Matthias was brought in to replace Judas. Um, the requirements for Matthias was that he had seen the resurrected Christ, that he had been there um, for all of the instruction um, and so on and so forth. The, these are the requirements for an apostle. Um, that's an apostle. Anyone who preaches the gospel is a preacher, um, but there are only very specific and limited men um, who were apostles. Yes. Modern day apostles, that's a heretical concept. There are no modern day apostles. And anybody who calls himself an apostle is a deceiver or he's being deceived or both because there are no modern day apostles. Uh, Ephesians chapter two makes it clear that the apostles and the prophets are the foundation upon which the church is built, right? You lay a foundation and then you build on top of it. You don't do more foundations, right? So we don't, have, we don't have people who are parts of the foundation today. We have people who are parts of the superstructure today. So we don't have apostles today. Yes? Why do you think today when we see our numbers decreasing or we see people straying away from what we think is true? Mm-hmm. The question is, you know, when we see people going away from, from what we see as true and right, why do we think it's bad? Uh, we're wired that way. Yeah, and it is bad, right? Because we want, people to, we want people to know and worship and serve Christ. And so in that sense, it is bad. We don't want that. We want people to know the truth. We want people to come to repentance and faith. We're passionate about that happening in the lives of people. So. There is a sense in which we're supposed to see it as bad in that regard. But what's wrong is to see it as uh, a statement about us being bad or wrong. You know, there's a difference between the two. So we want to be passionate people who are not satisfied with that. But we don't want to allow that to bleed over into us being people who are willing to compromise and do anything and everything possible to make. See, that's the seeker sensitive movement, right? We want, to do, we want to design this place for people who hate God to feel comfortable here. Um, so no, that's, that's not the answer, you know? So there has to be a balance between us having a passion and a desire for all people everywhere to come to repentance and know the truth. And at the same time to recognize that there are people who will not endure sound doctrine and that that's going to happen. But we continue to fight nonetheless because we're not willing to just sit down and accept that. That's the balance that we have to strike. Yes. Alex, yes. For the leadership training, do you have to have a degree in something? No. No, you don't have to have a degree in, in something um, in order to be part of the leadership training. That's just something that you sort of apply with the elders. 
um, and, and then we, you know, sort of make an evaluation and, and move forward with those things. But that, that's just something you talk to the elders about. But no, there, there, there are no prerequisites for that. Say again. Oh, okay. So Alexander's saying it sounds like the goal is that we get these people and we evaluate them, and the goal is to send them to the world. But what about the process for the people who are serving inside the church? It's the same. It, it's the same. See, not all these people. Remember last week we talked about, you know, um, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the remotest parts of the world. Most of the people didn't go beyond Jerusalem, Judea, right? Not everybody who goes through our training is gonna be a church planter. There's a very small percentage of people who, who have calling and gifting skills necessary to do that. Very, a very small number of people. Um, so a lot of the people who go through that process end up serving right where they're, right where they're trained um, or, or close to where they're trained. Um, you know, not, not all of them are going to go to the remotest parts of the world. Um, you know, but we train them, and then God sends them wherever they need to be. You know, that has to be our stance. Our stance is we're equipping and we're preparing people. We don't equip people and prepare them and go, you know, we're equipping you and preparing you. You know, you have to stay here, though. We, we, can't, we, can't, we can't do that. Yes. Yes. Yeah, good question. Talked about the difference between the guy who needs a stick and the guy who needs a carrot. And the question is, if he needs a stick, would that be evidence that he doesn't have a calling? Uh, not necessarily. Because, here's, here's a couple, let me give you a couple of examples. And um, this goes back to Giselle's question. Today we've turned ministry into a profession. So some of those people who need a stick, they're sitting there and they're saying, well, I'm not qualified for this because I don't have a seminary degree. And everybody knows you've got to have a seminary degree in order to be a legitimate minister, right? And so the stick may be to disabuse him of that notion, right? That's one thing that's pretty common today um, because there are people who are sitting there and they're, they're gifted and called. And here's the irony. These same people who in America would go, yeah, you know, you gotta have a seminary degree. You take them to a third world country, you know, where the gospel is preached and people are saved and, and it's a burgeoning church. And you know, you got guys who are barely literate, but it's obvious that the hand of God is on them and they'll go, yeah, this guy, this guy needs to be a minister here. But then they come here and it's like, no, you have to have a seminary degree and you have to have a, right? There's this double standard. Because of, because of what we've turned the ministry into here in our culture. Um, it's helped us in some regards in that we have very well-equipped um, men serving here, and that's an incredible blessing. But it's hurt us in some other regards in that there are some individuals who, because of various circumstances in their life, haven't had the opportunity to be able to go and get some of those you know, different types of training. Uh, but they're still called and gifted men who need to be serving. Um, so no, needing the stick is not automatically evidence that you're, you're not called. It could be evidence that you're just looking at the wrong thing. Yes? Uh, to your point, I think Jonah is a very good example of somebody who needed a stick. Yeah, Jonah needed a stick. Interestingly, he was already called. He was already called and serving and he still needed a stick. Yeah, sometimes I need a stick. Yes. Yes. How do you recognize gifted men within the church? Great question. How do you recognize gifted men within the church? Um, a number of things. Partly through the conversations that we have with men. Um, we have conversations with men, and we, there's certain things we listen for in conversations with men. Certain things we look for in the way men interact with other people. Certain ways that we look for men to be ministering to other people. Um, and so we talk about that and we see that. Um, and then beyond that, when you see it, 
you have more purposeful conversations with these men. And then we may look for opportunities for them um, to serve in ways that may be a little bit more you know, public. Uh, maybe, may, maybe you lead a discussion on, you've noticed that some of our guys in their, in their training, they'll, it, it, the, in the monthly men's meeting, they may lead discussions on you know, the book that we're going through and stuff like that. Things that are, things that are safer. Um, you know, and now we have this platform. And you know, we, you'll have guys who will you know, teach during, during this time. Um, just ways that we can look and see in their personal life and then in their public execution of duties. Um, yeah, there, there's a lot of ways that we do it, but we're always doing it. Always doing it. Yeah. Yes? So if you look at Paul, you mentioned earlier about how uh, 2 Timothy 1 1, I'm sorry, 2 Thessalonians, he says, hold on to tradition. But when I look at by tradition, how we typically run across them, they, they've been something that you hold on to first, right? In, in, in spite of what you read in the Bible. But when he's talking tradition here, what, what, is, what is he talking The about? apostolic traditions. Yeah, that was the whole, that's the whole heading. It's their apostolic traditions that are passed on. This is what we have in the, in the epistles. This is why we have the epistles. And so interestingly enough, for people will always say, well, we need to go back to the church in Acts, right? You hear this all the time, right? Well, the church in Acts was filled with problems. That's why you have the epistles. We need to be more like a first century church, like Corinth. They were a mess, right? That's why we have the epistles. You see, Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, they just show us what happened. The epistles give us guidelines for what's supposed to be normative, okay? So go back to the regulative principle. When we talk about the regulative principle, how do we worship God? How do we set up the church? You, you worship God and you set up the church in accordance with what you find in the epistles, what you find in the scriptures. That's the way you do it. So those are the apostolic traditions. That's why you have the reading of scriptures, right? This is why you have the prayers. This is why you have preaching. This is why you have the Lord's Supper. This is why you have the singing of psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. You know, this is why you have these various elements, confession, you know, the, the amen, the affirmation. The, see, this is why our worship service looks like it looks, because we're holding to apostolic tradition as opposed to just going with the spirit of the age, you see? And so there are these elements that we find that are part of those apostolic traditions. Those are the things that we hold to. And so a lot of times when people are looking at, for example, a church service, they'll say, well, you know, we, we like this more than that, as opposed to saying, this is in keeping with apostolic tradition. That's not in keeping with apostolic tradition, okay? There are a lot of things that I like but we don't make determinations about what we do in worship based solely upon what we like. When we gather in this place, this is not about my opinions, your opinions, my preferences, his preferences. That's not what this is about. When we gather in this place, we are about what the apostles have handed down to us and about doing those things that they say are essential. See, that's the difference. Now, if there are things that we just do that we hold on to, you know, um, okay, sorry. It was coming, it was coming, but it didn't come. If there are things that we hold on to, you know, just because, well, you know, there are things that we've known, well, well now we got a problem, you know, um, because now we're not, now, now we're not talking about whether or not we're holding to the apostolic traditions, we're talking about whether we're holding to the traditions of men, right? Yeah, robes on choirs, right? Well, we need to, we gotta do that. Well, why? Well, well, well cause, cause that's what we do, you know? Um, there's a great story uh, that I often tell, you know, talking about tradition. Um, First Baptist Church of Houston, um, back in the, this is back in the 1800s. Um, and I think it may be, um, written on the story of one of the past, you know, you go down that hallway and you see all of the, the former pastors of First Baptist, you know, and guys from different eras or whatever, and that's an old, old church. And there was one pastor who was very controversial. 
because of things that he tried to bring in to the church. And one thing that he tried to bring into the church, um, this, this contemporary thing he tried to bring into the church caused quite a stir. Um, and eventually the people took it out of the church and it was found floating in Buffalo Bayou. Um, it was an organ. <laughs> you see, there was a time when that was just considered completely out of line and too contemporary, right? Um, nowadays, we think of it as being old and traditional, right? So do we need to have an organ? Do we need to not have an organ? Um, that's not what we're talking about when we talk about apostolic tradition. That's not what we mean. Uh, we need to sing together, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Um, it, it's biblical to have musical instruments to help you sing those psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. What kind of musical instruments? What has he given us? Right now he's given us some folks who play the piano, who play the cello, who play the violin. Um, you know, we're, we're grateful to that. Um, and it helps us to sing without drowning, you know, the, the building in sound. Um, great, praise the Lord. Love that, you know. I wish he'd send us a viola but he hasn't done it, you know? Wish we had somebody who cranked that thing up back there, but he hasn't done it, you know? Um, and so we, we you know, we, we do what we have and we take on a character based on, you know, sort of what he's given us. Um, so that's, that, does, that, does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Ah, okay. And he, ta he talks about preaching. Does there have to be a specific time in minutes or whatever for preaching? No, no, there doesn't, doesn't have to be a specific time um, in, in terms of minutes or things like that. Um, but you, you're right in talking about the centrality of preaching. I um, mean, this is one of the hallmarks of the Reformation, um, is that the proclamation of the gospel becomes central to what we do, and that everything else is subservient to that. Um, I mean, that, that's, what we're, that's what we're here for, you know? That, that's one of those ordinary means of grace that we just, we're just not gonna do without it. Um, and it's going to be central because of its nature, because of what it gives us that other things cannot. Um, so it's gonna be central. How much time it's given, um, that, you know, that'll change. That change that, sometimes that'll change from week to week, you know?